suggest that the inquiry needs to examine closely how a climate has been created in which such obvious and overt racism can breed and wreak such appalling habit with impunity. In part, there are three answers to this. The first is that it lies with those in our community who continue to applaud and support these attitudes and activities. It also lies with those who remain silent or indifferent and who are not prepared to confront such attitudes at source. Thirdly, and perhaps most pertinently for this inquiry, the climate is created by law enforcement agencies which fail to take speedy and effective and committed action to pursue such illegality. The magnitude of the failure in this case, we say, cannot be explained by mere incompetence or a lack of direction by senior officers or a lack of execution and application by junior officers, nor by woeful under-resourcing. So much was missed by so many that deeper causes and forces must be considered. We suggest these forces relate to two main propositions. The first is dealing with the facts themselves that the victim was black and there was as a result a racism, both conscious and unconscious, that permeated the investigation. Secondly, the fact that the perpetrators were white and were expecting some form of protection. The inordinate and extensive delays and inactions, some of which, to use the phrase already applied, were crass, give rise to one plain inference and one plain question, which we suggest has to be boldly addressed. Was the initial investigation ever intended to result in a successful prosecution? The process being undertaken by all of us must begin from a clear and unequivocal premise that this was a racist killing. The forces that applaud and support and continue to support racism go unabated up to the doors of this inquiry. Uh, that following passage uh, it is in the book we're going to discuss today. It's also a direct quote from the public inquiry uh, in 1998. Uh, into the murder of Mr. Stephen Lawrence. Um, real pleasure uh, to do this program. I uh, hope people who are listening, uh, who are in the States, if you're not familiar um, with uh, what we're going to discuss today, hopefully getting more information about the book. In this case, you will get a much better understanding of the importance of studying and combating racism and you will understand this is a worldwide problem. Uh, even though I'm in the States, I've never been to London, the system of racism, white supremacy, a global system. And uh, with that said, we are delighted uh, to uh, have our guest for today's program. Uh, she is a trustee for the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust. Uh, she is the author of And Still I Rise. Seeking Justice for Stephen Lawrence. Uh, she is the mother of Stephen Lawrence, uh, who was murdered uh, in April of 1993 uh, by a gang of teenage racists in England. No one was ever punished, and uh, we will hear more uh, about this tragedy and uh, this mother's effort uh, to secure justice for her son. Uh, our guest joining us live from the United Kingdom, uh, Mrs. Doreen Lawrence. Uh, Mrs. Lawrence, are you with us? Yes, I am. Wow. Um, um, I presume it's, it's, it's afternoon over there? 
Uh, well, for me, it's actually morning. It's a, uh, it's about eleven thirty in the morning for me. Um, I think it's evening for you. Is that correct? Um, yes, it's um, seven forty-five in the evening here. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, big time difference. <laughs> big time difference. But uh, I think the common thread, the reason uh, for this program, even with that big time difference and so much distance between us. Um, the system of racism, white supremacy. Um, I have a, an unfortunate understanding of uh, what I think took place in this case, but I'm excited to have you on the program. Um, I guess for people who are not informed, they haven't read the book, they are not uh, in the UK, so maybe they don't know about Stephen Lawrence, if you could kind of give us a, a brief introduction to get started, and uh, then we'll hop more into the book as we go. Okay, um, Stephen was 18 when he died, so this April would make it um, 18 years um, since he was killed. Um, Stephen um, was an A-level student. Um, he went out for the evening to visit his uncle um, with a friend. Um, he was on his way home, and waiting at a bus stop um, to get home. And um, my understanding is that um, they walked down... Um, to the end of the road to see if the bus was coming. And while they were walking down and on the way back up to the bus stop, a group of young men was crossing the road and saw them and shouted out, what, what, nigger. And so before Stephen could react, um, they surrounded him and, um, and, and stabbed him. And he had, I think, about three different wounds to his body, one that really severed his... Um, um, in his throat that severed the main vein and and so he fell to the ground and there was a, quite a few people at the bus stop but I think at the time they probably didn't realise what was happening and Stephen's friend um, Molly said to him come on let's run and which didn't help because while Stephen was running he was just pumping out blood and he ran about 250 yards and he fell, but he fell into the recovery position. And um, Dwayne was trying to get, um, um, there was, this is on a main road, so it wasn't a back street. It was a, a very busy road uh, where cars were up and down, and nobody would stop. Um, he was flagging down cars. Nobody would stop. He went to a telephone box and tried to call, and... He couldn't get through. I think when he got through to the operator, they couldn't understand him because I think he was in such shock. And there was a couple who um, he saw, so he approached them for help. And they thought they were a white couple. They thought a black man, um, he's coming to rob them. So they went into the church and ignored him. And it was an off-duty off police officer saw and stopped. And he call the ambulance, but then by the time the ambulance come, um, I think the police arrived before the ambulance, and they did no first aid, they did not even touch him. They were concerned, um, their concern was that Stephen and his friend was in a fight with a gang, and proceeded to question Dwayne rather than look to see if there's anything they could do for Stephen, they just left him there, and by the time the, the ambulance arrived, I think Stephen died at the scene. Um, there was somebody across um, at the bus stop who lived near where we lived, and he came knocking on our door. That's how come we found out what had happened, and said that Stephen and his friend had been attacked. And we left our house, um, my ex-husband and I, and we drove down to where the, the description of where the young man said where he saw the incident happened, and we saw nothing, we didn't see a police car, we didn't see anything. So we thought he had gone to the hospital, that he had made his own way to the hospital, which wasn't that far. So that's where we went to. And when we got there, um, I noticed a police officer in front of me and um, a black boy, but I did not notice it was Dwayne at the time. And so I'm trying to question the nurses to find out whether or not if he was there. And eventually they came out and said... Um, and showed us into a room, and then came back and said um, that Stephen had died. And that was such, such a shock. That was not what I was expecting. I, you know, I thought he may have been hurt. 
but not that he was fatally um, injured, that he would have died. And that is where my struggle started, because on that night, the police did not approach. They did not say to us what had happened. They did not come and see us that night. And so if we hadn't been to, to the hospital, we would not have known that anything had happened to Stephen. They didn't come to our house until about midday the following day. And as I say, that is where our battle started, because every step of the way, the police did not want to know and we would give an information which would pass on to the police. They ignored us. Um, they they said they've never met a black family like us before. And they were not interested in um, finding Stephen's killers. And it took us from 93 to um, 98, 99 to find out the full extent of what happened to Stephen. That was the inquiry happened. Wow. Wow. Uh, again, uh, the name of her book, And Still I Rise, Seeking Justice for Stephen. Um, you talk a lot about racism uh, in this book and institutional racism, and uh, we'll touch on the importance uh, of what happened, uh, your son being murdered by these racist white teenagers, um, and the importance that that had in, in getting people to discuss institutional racism, what that means and how that works. Um, the term that I use, which I think is uh, similar to the term institutional racism, uh, it would be white supremacy, uh, the global system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, I use the two terms racism and white supremacy as synonyms, and I use the same definition for both terms. Uh, the definition that I use is as follows. Uh, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you believe that such a system exists and do you think that definition is accurate? Um, definitely, certainly. Um, that definitely does exist. Um, um, I think the difference between the white um, supremacy and what's happened over in the States to what happened here, um, my understanding is around the Ku Klux Klan and what, how they used to, um, back in the day, during slavery and even much after that, when, um, you know, wearing up the white cloak. Over here... In this country, racism is such that um, I can remember when my stepfather first arrived is that um, you had the signs when people were looking for somewhere to live is that no Irish, um, no blacks, no dogs. So if you wanted somewhere to live, that's the sign that's been put up in the window. So you find that the only way that people of color could um, find anywhere to live, they had to together um, try and save and to buy a house and then rent it out to each other. Whites would not rent to them, you know, and that is, um, um, I mean, so it, that doesn't happen so much now because it's more um, um, covert, it's not overt racism that you see now, especially since Stephen's case because there's a law now that if you are outwardly racist, then you can be taken to court over it. So it is more more subtle little things that they do now. They can't be overt in their manner and how they treat you and to say you can't sit in, you know, you can't sit in the bus or anything like that. You know, you don't see too much of that, but it's there. It's there in how um, people try to find work, um, that it doesn't matter what um, degree that you have, as long as, as soon as they look at your name and if your name doesn't sound too English, you don't even get an interview. So that sort of thing still happens now. Wow. I, I hope people uh, who are listening in the States uh, and other parts of the world, I strongly suspect that that will sound very familiar. Um, white people just being more subtle about the way that they practice racism, white supremacy. Um, I want to actually start <clears throat> towards the latter portion of your book. Uh, I thought this was very interesting because most of the time when I hear people uh, talking about racism or experiences where they've been mistreated and they think it was because of racism, uh, I'm not angry, I'm not bitter, 
And you didn't say that uh, on page 231. Uh, you said, in all that time, anger stopped me from going insane. Anger at all the things the police were doing and saying. Anger at the judicial system. The lawyers exploiting loopholes for the suspects. The complacent judges bending over backwards and never in our direction. I tried to continue my coursework when I felt that I could not do anything about Stephen's case. I needed the distraction of escaping into my studies. The rest of the time, I was going off to campaign meetings, meetings with the police and our lawyers, hoping against hope that we would find a way of making justice prevail. Um, can you kind of talk about the anger that you had about how your son, uh, his murder and uh, the way that uh, his case really was mishandled, botched and this racism that uh, even prevented justice uh, for the people who uh, executed your son? Yeah, the, I mean, so the anger that I had, I mean, so I don't I don't have as much anger as, as, as I did then. Um, I, I think that's what really kept me going because I looked at Stephen and Stephen was a young man. He was bright, intelligent. He had a future. These people who took his life don't have a future. They, you know, um, if, if you were to see them, I, I'm, I'm not even saying if you've seen any of the newspapers um, during the time of the inquiry, they're vicious-looking young people. And, and for me, my son was better than them. And the mere fact that the police, you know, they couldn't even look me in the eye when they're speaking to me. The fact that they think that my son had worth nothing. And because uh, there's a couple of those boys that their family is into, they're, criminal, they're, they're into criminality. And so within the police, they were supporting them because, you know, as, as part of what came out of the inquiry, there was a lot of corruption. And it was, it was said that one of the, one of the, the boys, his family, was well known and he's been protected by, um, um, by, by the police. And so when you have to live those things day in and day out and you know that your son was worth something and you're struggling to, to, to get some sort of justice, it was just so hard. It was just so hard. So, and I think for me, I, um, they expected me, as you know, they said they've never met a black woman like me, which I think is just completely rubbish. There's thousands and thousands of women like myself. What gave me the strength? I have no idea. I, you know, I am a religious person, and all I can say is through the help of God to help me to stay strong and to be able to stand up to these people. So every day, you know, I, before I walk through the door, I would say a prayer because as I put one foot one foot in front of the other, I have no idea what's going to happen to me when I go outside. And because I know um, what my son was. I wanted to make sure that I was his voice. He no longer had a voice. And for all the campaigning I was doing, I was his voice because I felt he deserved better, much better than how, how I and my ex-husband and my, and my family were treated. I think sometimes um, when, uh, as a black person, you walk down the street and, you, and you're looking at people, you have no idea what their thoughts are about you especially during the time of Stephen. And because my face was getting so well known, my concern was whether or not I would, I would be attacked. And at one point, yes, we were. Our vehicle was attacked. We had our tires slashed. Um, we've had um, phone calls and letters are sent to us, you know, um, racist letters that were sent to us. So over that period of time, it was very difficult. And plus, I have two other children. And so for me, it was trying to protect them. And so there was no pictures taken of my children, my other two children. Because for me, you know, I just felt if their face were known, that they couldn't walk about, that they wouldn't be safe. So that's a struggle, you know, for how many years that, that I've had to go through. Um, my children are all grown up now. Um, my son is a teacher, and my daughter, she's, she's a designer. So they've managed to... to get a life, you know, make a life for themselves. But the worry for me is still there, you know, because I keep thinking that as soon as anybody knows who they are, would their life be in danger? 
So it's, it's that struggle. Within my book, when I talk about my fear and my worry and all the stuff I have, that I've had to go through, it's been a living nightmare. It has been a really living nightmare. And the only thing I can take comfort from is the fact that I know the truth and I know what my son was like. And so these people who took his life, you know, it's... I, don't, I wouldn't say I wish them death or anything. I do not wish that. But at the same time, I wish their parents would feel the same pain as I have felt over the years around Stephen. Mm-hmm. Context of white supremacy. For people who are listening at Blog Talk Radio, you can see the uh, five individuals uh, that are reported to have murdered uh, Mrs. Lawrence's son. Uh, you can see all five of them. Uh, their names are listed. Um, they're numbered, so you can read the whole caption and see exactly what they look like. Uh, just look at the description, and you'll get to see all five of these white folks to know exactly what Mrs. Lawrence is uh, talking about. Um, you talked in the book about the fact that uh, you were not uh, very political before uh, your son's mistreatment. And you said that you really weren't into racism. That's not something that you focused on. You were aware that black males in particular had a lot of pressures on them. You were aware that, you know, black people were mistreated and there were even murders before uh, Stephen Lawrence, uh, his execution in 1993. Can you kind of talk about that? You that, you know, you're before the uh, the incident in 93, um, your behavior, your life. Yeah. Um, I lived in an area where um, it was mixed, um, mixed family lived there. My my immediate next door um, was a white family, and we got on really well. You know, we shared everything together. You know, my children play with her children. And so, you know, we I grew up, um, even though, you know, I would hear, I think what it is, as I was saying, it's mo- it's, it was mainly aimed at men more so than women. And so... There was nothing outwardly that I would say that within my area that I lived that people were being racist towards me or my children. So, you know, those I think, you know, I would go to work. And as I said, while I was studying, I had white friends, myself, my husband. But we, you know, we didn't put anything down to, oh, that person they don't like us because we are black. We live in a community at the time. After Stephen's death, that's when I realized that the people around me, and that is not my next, my immediate neighbor, but people who lived in front of our houses and that, because when Stephen died and we were out going out and coming in, nobody said, I'm really sorry to hear that your son had died. All we had was people just staring at us. A young girl came to visit, and she went to the same school as Stephen. And um, I said to her, that people are telling me the area in which I live in is a racist area um, and because there's not something that I experienced at the time. And I said, is this true? And she had tears in her eyes and she said to me, yes. Now, whether or not I was blind to those things and, and also because, you know, I saw people as people. I don't look for anything to say, oh, that person over there is racist and, you know, I mustn't speak to them. I spoke to everybody. And now how I find myself now, when I go out, I don't speak to anybody because that level of trust that I had when my kids were growing up and when I was young myself, I don't have that level of trust anymore. When you look at people, it's very difficult for me to say good morning to them, which is what I usually do and pass the day with them. No, I can't do that because you don't know who's around you who, who, who has a racist attitude towards you. So it, it, it holds you back from being the person that I used to be. And to be political, yes, I mean, I challenge. I think I had to challenge the system. I challenge the police. I challenge the justice system because I felt that they have let me and my son down and they continue to do that. There's been numerous investigation over the years. And because on that night they did not gather any evidence, they did not gather any evidence at all. So for them to find something to say that they can charge these boys with is very difficult. 
I understand now that um, forensic um, gathering, um, whatever information you have now, is much, is, you know, they can find even just on a pinhead, they can use that in order to, um, to identify. So whether or not in time to come, if they're able to do that around Stephen's case, I have no idea. But for me, I just think all I can do is just look at my two other children. I have three grandchildren now. And all I can do is put my all my energy into them and just pray that one day that we will get justice for Stephen. That's all I can do at the moment. Context of white supremacy. Um, my co-host is here, and I believe she has a few questions. Uh, for people who are listening, you can visit and get more information. Uh, the website for the Stephen Lawrence Center is www.stephenlawrence.org.uk. Uh, one more time, it is www.stephenlawrence.org.uk. Uh, Justice, if you have some questions that you would like to ask Mrs. Lawrence, uh, your line is open. Please go right ahead. Hello, Mrs. R. Lawrence. Hello. In your book, And Still I Rise, Seeking Justice for Stephen, you say the white world. What do you mean when you say the white world, and what is the white world? Um, well, in this country where I live, um, if you're white, you know, all the doors are open for you. If you're black, it is not. You know, a black person could have the highest qualification and they'll go and they'll go for a job with a white person. That white person don't have the same qualification or as high qualification as a black, but the white person will get that job. And so We've, you know, we're seen as a second-class citizen. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You know, you are a second-class citizen. Our children um, within schools have difficulty in getting the same education. And I will go to um, to a parents' evening. Stephen was an academic, so he's quite bright. And the teacher will say to me that you know Stephen's, you know, his work is very good. He's, he's, you know, he's got this grade. He's got excellent. And within a week, I had a note come to me and say to me that, you know, is Stephen using all the facilities in school? Is Stephen taking advantage of all the opportunities that he has? And I thought. Well, that can't be right because I've just been told how well he's doing. So I wrote back to the teacher and said, could you explain and tell me what has happened within the two weeks of me being to the school and, and you tell me how excellent he is? I had a note back to tell me that they got the wrong person. Now, how is that? You know, so, and then I said to Stephen, how many of your friends, your black friends, had letters like this? And he said, quite a few. How many, how many of their parents wrote? Because the parents feel that they, they trust the school, they trust the teachers. They never challenge, which is something that I do constantly. I have to challenge um, when, it, when anybody tells me anything, especially if I know that my son or my children are not what they say that they are. And so, as I say, within this country, if you're black, you're a second-class citizen. Oh, uh, not hearing justice. I will double check to make sure. Okay, try that one more time, Justice. Repeat your question. In the book, you say fair man and fair. What does a fair man do, and what do you mean when you say fair? What do I? Can you hold on just a minute? Sorry, Mayor. Good. Um, this is my granddaughter here, and my phone, my other phone is ringing, I'm sorry. Well, um, what do I mean by fair? Um, 
would that be would that be the then the color of the person's skin? Because sometimes when um, if you're mixed race or um, the pigment the pigment of your skin is a little bit lighter than others, I think that's the word that we mean by fair. That your skin is quite fair. Does that answer the question? And uh, could you answer the first part of the question also? Could you repeat that for me, please? Um, you didn't answer the first part of the question. Uh, do you mind if I read it? Yes, please. Okay. In the book, you say fair man. What does a fair man do? I, can't, I just can't remember that bit in the book at all about what a, what a fair man do. Um, is that to be, um, perhaps I mean by if, when people... Um, needs to be um, to be fair in how they treat you, and sometimes that's not always the case. I think within 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 the, um, the black community, we try to be fair to everybody, and you know, and I think sometimes that's not always the case when a black person is trying to achieve something, especially within education or or, or within the working environment. There's always, you know, you always have to be that little bit better than the other person when equality is something what we should um, always aim for. Does that help to answer the question? Yes. What were the names of people who did the crime? Um, well, the, the names that I that I know, because I, I think we've got, we've got to be very careful about how we name people. The boys that were accused of Stephen's um, murder, one of them was called Gary Dobson. The other one was called David Norris. There was the Acourt brothers, which is David, um, no, there was Jamie, um, Jamie Acourt and Neil Acourt, and another one called um, Luke Knight. Those those are the five five names that were given to us just after Stephen was killed. Do you think the people who did the crime are racist, white supremacists? Definitely, definitely that they, they are. Um, they have, they have been still. I mean, I said I used to hear what they used to do is they were cleaning knives in front of their windows. There were um, black people who had been attacked in the area before. Um, since Stephen's death, there was an off-duty police officer who they threw, one of them was threw, a, um, I think, a beer bottle or something at him. And in fact, he was charged for that. So they've, all, they've been known for their racist views for a long time. Do you think if non-white people did the crime, they would have got killed, got arrested right away? If so, why do you think that? Um, definitely. Um, since Stephen's death, there's been numerous killings happening, and all the white boys who were murdered, their killers have been brought to justice. There's been a numerous other black boys who have been killed, not just Stephen, but others, and they, their killers have not been brought to justice. Also, on the night when Stephen was killed, um, this is what I found out much later, is that um, the police were told where the boys, what road the boys ran down to. Now, the police did not chase after them. When I asked them why they did not chase after those boys when they were told where, which road the boys ran down, their answer to me was, it was late at night, and they couldn't go and knock on their doors. Now, had Stephen been a white boy, and and his and, and um, his killers were black, they would have arrested, and and that's what happened. They would have arrested his killers on that night. Did people talk about your son in the UK more when he was alive or when he died? Well, they talk about him more since he's died because Stephen's name in the UK, um, everybody knows about Stephen. 
um, because his name is, you know, since his death, laws laws have been changed because of all the stuff that we've um, that we've gone through and the challenge that we've done to the justice system. Young children are writing stories about Stephen. Um, undergraduates are doing courses um, and using Stephen as a, a point of reference. So his name is well known in this country now. I know that you kind of answered this question, but I want you to uh, elaborate more on it. Can you talk more about how did the white people you knew before your son was killed treat you compared to how those same white people treated you after your son was killed? Sounds like the treatment changed. Can you talk more about that? Um... I'm not saying so much that they've they changed. It's just that I think because I didn't notice. It wasn't something that was on my radar to say that person is not speaking to me because I'm black. You know, they, apart from my neighbor, um, the other families didn't really speak to us, but I didn't take any notice of it. But when Stephen died, I thought that people would be so horrified by how he died that they will be showing some sort of sympathy around um, around his death, and it was then I realised that no, there was no there was nobody saying I'm really sorry to hear about your son. Nobody ever spoke to us. All they did was just look at us, and that was when I realised that I was living in an area that I thought that an area where um, I was comfortable in living. And after seeing that, I realized, no, I don't want to live there anymore. And we no longer live in that area because we've moved away from there now. And and whenever I've been back, um, you know, it's not the same. You know, I think Stephen's death has taken away um, all my trust that I had in people, in the people that I used to live around, um, with the area in which I used to live in. How should non-white people react when someone classified as black is killed by white people? How sh- sorry, say that again. How should white people... Can you, can you how, repeat that, please? How should non-white people react when someone classified as black is killed by white people? I think, um, I suppose, for me personally, a death is a death. It doesn't matter who has died or who committed that crime. A crime is a crime, and they should be treated in the way in which a criminal should be treated, regardless of who they are, regardless of what color their skin is. Because when you start looking and start saying, oh, well, um, that person is black and he's been killed and that's fine, or a white, a white person's been killed and you should have no remorse. I don't believe in that. A death is a death, regardless of who has died. And a crime is a crime. So if I know that my son, who is black, and he has committed a crime and some a crime is that, I would dare to support him at the same time. I would not sit back and allow him to think that he that he can get away with that crime. What are some things non-white people can do to deal with the stress of racism white supremacy? Well, that's really difficult. I think people are at different stages. And people, um, it affects them in different ways. And I think sometimes you find not everybody can be open and be able to speak out when a, um, a racist thing is happening to them. Um, I think the difference, that's how I felt. And at the time, I wasn't thinking about racism and stuff at the time. What I was thinking about is that my son was killed, and these boys had murdered my son, and I want them to be punished for it. And so, as I say, we all act and behave in different ways when something, a tragedy has happened to us. And for me, um, rather than me being locked locked myself away, I was out there fighting to make sure 
that people knew what happened to Stephen and that these boys were, that people knew about them because I think they can hide away and say that, you know, nothing to do with them. But, you know, for me, I had to make sure that Stephen did not die in vain. You know, and I think the work that I've done over the years has proven that because I have not taken on hatred in a way in which I wish somebody harm. I've turned that around into doing something positive and doing something positive by setting the trust up that allows young people, regardless whether they're black or white, to attend the center and to to achieve their aims in life. And I just think that's just me. You know, I just feel that rather than me having bitterness, because all that does is, is, is that would harm myself, and so I just turn that negative into something positive. And, you know, and for young people now to, ach- uh, to achieve their dreams. And I think that's, that's something much better than me sitting and filling myself with hate. Uh, thank, you for your re- thank you for your responses. Uh, go ahead, Jess. Okay, thank you. Context of white supremacy. Um, You've already touched on the conduct of the enforcement officials, police officers. Um, I want to just share with our listeners so they get a a clear understanding of the conduct uh, of the enforcement officials. And then if you could share more about the way that they treated you. Um, the days and weeks immediately following the murder of your son. Uh, This is on page 83 of the book. One of the reasons that the surveillance took so long to organize, we learned much later, as we learned so much only when it was too late, was that the proper surveillance team was booked on the Monday after Stephen's death to observe another criminal. This was a young black man suspected of theft from the person. The black thief took priority over the white murderers. Even in my darkest moments, I would not have believed this possible. And in some ways, it is merciful that I did not know it at the time. I still wonder what happened to that young man and whether the police were able to get a conviction in his case. Can you talk about the conduct of the enforcement officers and how they treated uh, your family immediately following the murder? Yes, immediately. I mean, so after um, when Steve was murdered, um, we had, um, we were assigned what they call liaison officers. That um, the idea behind that is that for them to. Um, give us information of how the case was progressing. But instead, what they were doing is like they were spying on us. They will come to our house and they'll start questioning in like, who is these people in your house? What are their names? What are they doing here? And um, within um, a black families, if some, when, when the death has happened, um, your you know, close families and friends, everybody come and sit um, and talk with you and it just trying to show support but the police did not understand that and so they wanted to know as far as they were concerned that this is not a normal thing to happen and when they should have been set up the surveillance they allowed those boys to get rid of the evidence because they were leaving their houses with black bags I understand but the officers themselves, they, they did not have a telephone. They have no way of contacting their colleagues. They couldn't follow them. They didn't have a car to follow them. So they were able to dispose of the evidence. Now, each time when you look and, and you listen to things like that, and you wonder, did they really want to catch, you know, these people that had murdered my son? And as I said before, had Stephen been white, they would have arrested his killers because as, you know, if it's a black boy had murdered a white boy, they would have find ways. Because even um, there was a time there was a young man who was killed, a white boy was killed, and they um, arrested a black man 
and it turned out he had nothing to do with it. He had nothing to do with it. There was another occasion when a police officer um, was killed. Um, he went to um, answer an emergency call. And on that night, they got helicopters out. They had everything to, to track down. They, um, they tracked down somebody, turned out, and that was the wrong person also. And during that time, I had a meeting with the commissioner of police. And in his office, um, he said to me um, that he, he, he used um, the PC Dunn's case in with Stephen, saying that this officer was killed and they haven't found his killers. It's the same as Stephen. And I had to point out to him that on the night when PC Dunn was killed, they had helicopters out searching for their killers. On the night that my son was killed, they had nothing. They did not even send a car down the road to look for his killers. So do not compare the two of them. I was just so angry that he, he, he see fit to compare the two cases. And they were handled much different. And, I, you know, yes, I'm sorry that officer died, but they, they were treated too different, you know, differently. They, they, they did not invest the crime in the same way. And that continues to happen because we have this thing that they call now black on black killing, where um, black boys are um, stabbing or shooting each other. And they have a separate um, force that's supposed to investigate these crimes. They're called Trident. And nobody has been charged for these killings. They're black killings. They're not interested in finding out who killed these boys. Mm. And as far as I'm concerned, a death is a death, and it should be investigated. It doesn't matter what race it is. It should be investigated in the same way. And they are still not doing that. Today, they are still not doing that. So Stephen's case, where they did not give the time to look for his killers, is still happening in 2011. Mm. Wow. I just want to uh, point out white people do the exact same thing here, uh, just charging black people with any random crime, any and every crime, uh, innocent black people, they do the exact same thing here. Um, I also, you, you talk in the book, um, young man who was with your son uh, the night that he was murdered, uh, Dwayne Brooks, uh, who's also a black male. You talk about how he was not treated correctly by enforcement officials either. Um, can you kind of talk about how they treated him and, and particularly in comparison to the way they went after him in terms of prosecuting him for his role uh, in a disturbance, a public disturbance that took place protest? Yes, because um, they assume that, that Dwayne and Stephen was in a gang and that even though he, he, he was trying to tell them that, you know, he he is a you know he's a victim. They they did not want to know. They they uh, in fact he was they they took him to the police station. And I think he was there part of the whole night. Um, that he, he didn't have anybody with him, and even the days that followed that, he was living on his own in a hostel, and the police would just turn up and question him. So they did not treat him in the manner in which they should. And then he, there, there was, they had this anti-racist, um, they had this anti-racist march that happened down in um, Welling. And at the time in Welling, they had a, a BMP book, um, bookshop, I don't know if you know, which is, it's a British National Party that these groups call themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the um, anti-Nazi League decided not to march in central London, but to go down to Welling. And at the time, I think people got really angry and there was cars set alight. There was, there was a lot of disturbance and Dwayne was there. I don't know how much involved that he was, but the following day when the newspaper reported that, they had burning cars on one side and, and um, a group of people um, were 
who were protesting, and then in the middle, they had Neville and myself. It's more or less looking to say, we are the one who caused that problem that happened in that area. And it had nothing to do with us. And and this is the sort of thing that the police and and certain newspaper will do. They would always make the black person look as if to say they are the ones who are always at fault. We weren't at that we weren't at that demonstration. We knew nothing about it, we had nothing to do with it. But we were placed a photograph of us placed right in the middle of that disturbance. Wow. Uh, and I just pointing out for the listeners, um, the enforcement officers aggressively pursued prosecution against Mr. Brooks uh, for his role in this uh, protest. Um, this did not happen. He did not get, you know, this aggressive action uh, in the case of uh, Stephen Lawrence uh, and the suspects in his case. Um no, the the enforcement officers they made no effort to come to your home the night that your son was murdered. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's true. No, that they, they did not. And even in the hospital, when they knew it was us, they did not approach us either. They did not speak to us on that night either. Wow. And if well, I guess you can explain it this way. Um, how did Nelson Mandela impact? Uh, what happened in your case with regards to pursuing suspects? Um, we, were, um, so we were fortunate that he he arrived here in this country, and people around us who organise um, us to meet with him. And he was, I mean, so I, I was speaking about him just the other day. Um, I mean, so it, I'm only what five foot one, and Mr. Mandela's about six foot two, six foot four, and so I'm very small in comparison. And this this man made himself almost like um, come down to my level, and he was for him he was quite shocked because I think what's been happening over in South Africa for how many years, how um, the apartheid system and how blacks were treated. I presume he thought in this country, um, you know, things would be a lot different. And one of the and he was such so, so shocked to know that we were treated in the way in which we were and what happened to Stephen. And after we met with him, he did a press conference where he spoke about how black lives are cheap. And he assumed it only happened in South Africa and not in, not in the UK. And it was the following day that the police actually arrested three of the boys um, who we say was involved in Stephen's death. And I think had we met with him, I don't think they would ever have done that because the government at the day was a conservative government and they did not want to know. They did not want to know what happened to my son. It was Mr. Mandela that came here that actually instigating um, um, the first arrest that took place. Wow. Well, and how much time elapsed between the first arrest and the actual murder of your son? Um, two weeks, over two weeks. Mm. Wow. In your opinion, uh, did, did the enforcement officers, did they have any valid reason to wait that long um, in, in moving in on these suspects? Well, they claimed that they didn't know who they were, um, even though um, we were, um, people come to our house and give us the information say, and give us names, we pass on to the police. And I didn't know this at the time until much later, that people were um, leaving um, notes on their windscreen. There was one, uh, a man walked into a police station within 24 hours and gave them names, addresses, and they still didn't do nothing. They turned him away. So they had no intention of arresting. And I think because of, because of some of the killings that happened before, and nobody had challenged them, and this is the first time that they've been challenged in a way in which you know I was challenging them. And so I presume they were they were taken back by it. So they were hoping that by ignoring me, that I would go away. Because after at the same day that we saw Nelson Mandela, was the same day we had a a, a meeting at the police station, and. 
I suppose in my innocence, I believe that because I I personally wasn't given the information. So um, I knew we were going there. So all the names um, that we were given was written down in a book. I wrote it in a piece of paper and took it with me. And when I went into their office, I handed it to one of the officers. And I sat there and I watched him and he folded the paper. It was so small. And as I was leaving, I said to him, you're going to put that in the bin now, aren't you? And he just, he was just so shocked. He didn't know I was watching him. And he goes, no, 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 you know, we, we know we um, use everything that we have and we, you know, everything's evidence. But he would have thrown it away because they were not interested. They were not interested in, in finding Stephen's killers. Mm. I just, I want the listeners Hold that thought. You're the mother of the victim in this case, giving the enforcement officials information, suspects, and they fold it up to toss it in the trash can in front of the mother. Keep that in mind. Now, contrast that you wrote. It seemed that the enforcement officers, not all, but it seemed at least some of them uh, suggested that you all were the problem. You all just being pushy and your political supporters that you all were really the problem that was holding up the enforcement uh, and the investigation. Can you comment on that? Yes, I understand that. Um, there was a senior officer that he, he had nothing to do with the case, but he wrote a letter um, to our solicitor um, saying that, that we were up being um, obstructing them in their duties to carry out um, their investigation. So we were blamed for everything. And, you know, there's, there's nothing that we were doing. All we were doing is trying to give them information, asking how our case was progressing. And they didn't want to give us any information at all, you know. And so um, they accused us of obstruction and all we were trying to do is give them the information that people were giving to us and that's all we were doing we weren't doing anything else and i think you know as because we're black they, they expected us to be shouting swearing and just behaving badly and because we weren't we were speaking to them on their level they didn't really like it and so they were you know, making out that we were troublemakers. And in fact, you know, um, almost 18 years on, I, I was over at New Scotland Yard a couple of weeks ago. An officer is retiring, and he sent me an invitation to come to his, to his retirement reception. And, and I arrived there, you know, and a room is full of police officers and a few people who I know. And this officer that I used to do some work with, because over the years I've done quite a lot of work with um, um, with the police force and that. And he he said to me, um, "Are you still causing trouble?" And I just think, <laughs> after all this time, you know, they still view me as causing trouble. Eighteen years on, are you still causing trouble? Mm mm mm. Wow. Mm, wow. Yeah, that was a, that was a bit of a shock. Wow. Did did uh, did you use the term uppity in the book or am I making that up that they, you know, thought of you all as uppity black people? Well, yes, they they, they definitely did. Mm, mm. You know, cuz they, they kept saying that, you know, they've never met a black family like us before. As far as far as they're concerned, all black people are criminals, you see. You know, we're all criminals, so you know, to be actually um, not swearing, not shouting, not throwing things at them, that obviously there's something not quite right with us. Mm. It is uh, it is a little afternoon, uh, my time. I think it is close to 9 p.m. your time. Uh, I feel like we are next door neighbors. <laughs> um, I can relate totally, totally. Um I want to double check and see if Justice, if you have some other questions that you would like to ask Mrs. Lawrence, uh, your line is open. Please feel free. You use the term social justice. In your book, what is social justice? 
Okay, social justice is where we where um, we as individuals expect to be given justice, and that is not happening. You know, we expect justice, and and which is you know all our rights. You know, you know as um, as as um, humanities, we expect to have social justice. And that has been denied of um, within the, within as well in this country that I, I can only speak of this country um, for black people. You know, a lot of us are still fighting for justice. How did you learn about and understand racism? White supremacy is a huge problem. As a child growing up, um, you hear about things and then you start reading, you read all the stories, you hear all the things happening over in America and different parts of the world. And so racism doesn't really affect many women. It's, mo- it's mainly men that it seems to affect. And when I left school and I was working, excuse me, what's wrong? Okay, okay. So I've got my granddaughter, so she's speaking to me. Yeah, when um, when I was growing up and at school, we, as young women, didn't have the problem, but used to hear the stories of men and young boys. I remember I used to say to Stephen, because I used to read about it in the papers, that they'd be walking down the road or whatever, and they'll be just be thrown in the back of, of a police van and they'll be beaten up. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. And so I've always wanted to protect him. So I said, tell him these stories and say, you have to be very careful. And all he used to say to me is that, Mum, I'm not doing anything, so nothing should happen to me. And how wrong he was. How wrong he was. You don't have to do anything. As a young black man... You don't have to do anything for these things to happen to you. And that's exactly what happened to Stephen. And a lot of young men like him. Why did you use Maya and and Angelo's poem? Gus, how do you pronounce that? Um, Maya Angelou. Um, um, I'm, I've met her. You title your book. And, and still I rise. Because in some respect, I feel that's what's been happening with me. I have met my Angela a few times, she, which has been here to the UK. And um, when I thought about the title, um, the publishers contacted her because, you know, I had to get permission. And she was happy to let me use the title. She was happy to let me use the title because I feel that within myself is that, you know, I've been knocked down how many times um, during my struggle um, to get justice for Stephen. And within the faith I have within myself, I think, you know, that's kept me going. And so I thought that's quite an apt title to use. I know that non-white people listening got constructive information, but what specific constructive information have you shared that you think may help non-white people learn and understand racism, white supremacy? Um, I think, you know, we're all here, you know, regardless whether you're black or white, and respect is what we should have for each other. And that's the sort of thing, um, when my children were growing up, that is what I tried to teach them. Even all these things that's happened to Stephen, I would never, ever say to my children that, you know, you see that white person there, you know, you need to be rude, you need to... No, that is not what I teach my children. I have grandchildren now. And you have to teach children or teach people to be respect and have tolerance. You know, we may be different on the outside, but we all are the same inside. Okay, there's some who have 
really bad thoughts and want to hurt other people. But for me, that is not how I see life should be. Thank you. I don't you? Have... Yes. Thank you. I don't have any more questions at this time. Go ahead, Gus. Okay. Conics of white supremacy. Um the suspects, the five suspects that you named, and I just want to point out this is not being uh reckless uh with regards to speaking about these individuals saying that they're racist uh and that they are the murderers, uh the newspaper uh in the UK. They put on the front page, they listed these gentlemen as murderers and mm. dared them to, you know, bring a lawsuit, and it has never happened. So I just want to make sure I point that out. We're not being reckless mm. and throwing things around here. Um, on page 148 of your book, you talk about the uh, surveillance that these five suspects uh, were under. And just so I can give an idea, uh, people can really get a clear understanding of the conduct and the thinking uh, of these folks, these white guys. Um, you write <clears throat> uh, that these gentlemen, they were in their teens when they murdered Stephen Lawrence. Uh, they had their lives in front of them. They should have been thinking about going to college and making something of themselves. Instead, their only topics of conversation were violence and beating and weapons and the racism they could not watch a football match or a sports personality of the year award without degrading themselves, snarling if a black sportsman did well or an African team looked as though it might rise in the rankings. They were obsessed when an advertisement on television showed happy black people in the Caribbean Contrasted with the cold and misery of an English winter, Gary Dobson told his friends that this was racist, that it was meant to show white people in a bad light. Every message they got from the outside world seemed to have racial meaning for them. How do you produce children who think and behave like that? They talked endlessly and mindlessly about what they would like to do to black people, saying, for example, that every black person should be chopped up and left with nothing but stumps, and not realizing they were being filmed. They acted out their fantasies. Can you uh, talk a little bit just about what you saw, what you learned about these five gentlemen? Um, yeah, during the, I think it might have been about the third investigation, that they put a camera in one of their premises. And from there, and I think uh, I, anybody realized um, the nature of these young people and their thoughts and how they've been, and, you know, their own thinking. And, you know, you saw this, Stabbing, um, how they would stab a stab a person, and you, see, they were just, you know, it was just such an awful, awful thing to watch. Is that it's hard to believe that anybody thinks like them, but that this, this is what they are. And I think the first time I saw that, it was during, um, I think it was in '95, when we take out a private prosecution because. Um, the the CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, was not doing anything. So we, as a family, said, this is what we're going to do, is to try and get some justice around Stephen. And uh, a police officer, because, I mean, so there has been some really good officers that I've met over the years. They're not all bad, I should say. They're not all. There was, um, his name was Perry Nose, and he instructed his officer to put this camera so they thought that they were being recorded. They did not realize that they were being filmed. So there's sometimes that they would speak and not name Stephen or not name what they've done, but they make um, gestures. And so we were at, so when they're watching TV, everything was being recorded. I was just so shocked to see that. I was just so shocked to see that these young men, 
instead of looking to see how they can improve their lives, that they were so obsessed with a, how a black person is and what they want to do to a black person and an Asian person, who they call a paki. You know, it's just unbelievable that those thoughts were there. And I think in all my life, I've never seen anything, and I've not seen anything since as bad as that. Hmm. You wrote about uh, your experience being in the same room uh, with these uh, racists uh, and their parents. And you said that you noted a, a similar feeling from uh, some of these uh, racists their parents. Can you talk about some of uh, what you experienced when you did have contact with some of the moms of these individuals? Yeah, I think that they... Okay. If you were to see the wounds that Stephen had and the way in which he suffered before he died, you can't help thinking that somewhere that, you know, that the, the mothers would have some sympathy to think that someone else's child, you know, someone has lost their child in that way. And there was nothing like that. They looked at me with contempt um, that I dared to, to accuse their sons of committing this crime against Stephen. As far as they were concerned, that their children were angels and that we were the bad people. So they looked at us with contempt. So it was very hard sitting in a room because, you know, as a mother and, you know, if you think somebody has died and died such an awful, you know, your heart will go out to that person. There was nothing like that. There was nothing like that at all. They, they had contempt for me. Wow. Um, again, I want to point out uh, no one uh, has ever been punished uh, for the murder uh, of Stephen Lawrence. Um, they had uh, an inquiry, a public inquiry, to um, investigate the police conduct uh, with regards to the murder investigation around Stephen Lawrence and if the police, uh, the job that they did, um, the opening passage that I read at this program that was from that public inquiry, uh, at least from the book, I got the impression that many of the enforcement officers, um, that they were deceptive, uh, even shockingly deceptive in making a complete change in some of the things that they said to you. I know you talked about John uh, Carnt. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly, and how when you first met him, he seemed sincere, like he really wanted to help your family and, and do good work on this case, and then it totally changed. Uh, can you talk mm. about that? Yeah, um, this is, um, I think, it's the same inquiry where they were doing the filming. So those officers with our legal team were working very closely together. And they would, you know, say, you know, all about the first investigation, that information, how they didn't gather anything, and led us to believe that they thought these officers were wrong in how they conduct themselves. So it wasn't until we had the inquest and so once the private, the private prosecution had failed, that was when they did the inquest, which was back in 1997, that they did the inquest. And, and he was on the stand. So when they were asking him questions as to the conduct of the first officers who investigated Stephen's murder, I expected him to tell the inquiry or the inquest exactly what he was telling us. At the, you know, when they were doing their investigation. But instead, he said that the only, the only problem that he felt that had taken place during the first investigation was the relationship with the family and the um, liaison officers. And that was all that he saw at that time. Now, I got so angry because all the time he led us to believe that the first investigation was flawed, those officers did not do their jobs properly and, 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 and around their behavior. But yet, when he was talking at the inquest, he said something completely different. So he actually lied under oath. He lied. 
and the um, assistant commissioner um, realized how angry I was and trying to apologize and, and said he didn't say what he said he did, you know what he said at the time. And yes, he did. And I've never seen the officer again. I have no idea where he is. I've never heard another word about him. But every time I speak to police officers, I, I, you know, I make them understand that the reason why we had the public inquiry was because of this one officer who lied, which made me decide to take out and put a complaint in against them. Because if he hadn't lied, I don't think we, I don't think we we would have had the public inquiry. Mm. Um, the inquiry um, in 1998, um, I think it's referenced the McPherson uh, report. Um, this inquiry, um, they concluded that the police were institutionally racist in quotes, uh, and they made a total of 70 recommendations. For reform, um, can you talk about some of the findings of that inquiry and specifically around institutional racism? Because I think that was when that term began being used frequently was as a result of this inquiry. Yes, um, the Metropolitan Police were found to be in, to be institutional racist um, around Stephen's case, and cause during, during that time of the inquiry. They had many representation of different groups and different um, within the black community coming and giving statements um, around their experience of the police. Because there have been several riots over the years. We had the riot in um, in the 80s, and out of that, you had the Scarman report, which nobody took any notice of. And so, on the panel of the inquiry, they had a a doctor, they had a police officer, they had a, um, a minister, he was a um, John Santamu. So they, they had enough different people from different backgrounds and they wanted to make sure that whatever came, whatever recommendation came out of this inquiry, that the government of the day would actually implement them. And... Um, the centre recommendation, most of them was around the police and how one was to do with um, retention and progression of black officers in the force. One was around the stop and search and that anybody who was stopped must be given a record of the reason why they were stopped and the officer who stopped them. Um, another one was around, around racial incident that every racist incident needs to be reported and be recorded. And within schools, if um, a racist incident took place in schools, it must be publicized so that parents knew um, about the school that racist incidents are taking place. Um, what's the other one? I can't remember all of them. But those were the major, major ones. And the stop and search one, um, about recording where a person is being stopped, and if a police stop an, if a police if a police officer stop an individual, and asks them to give account of where they are and where they're going, that a record must be made and a copy be given to that individual. So if later on he wants to make a complaint, he has a record. Now the police did not like that, and they have spent the past six years complaining that it's the it's bureaucracy, the amount of forms that they have to fill out, and that individual do not want them do not want them to stop um, to fill out the forms. They it's, there's a lot of smoke screen. Now, one of the things the police did not do, they did not inform the public as to the reason why, when they are stopped, why a record must be made. So, yes, people didn't want to hang around to get a record. That's only because they didn't understand the reason why. Because it was beneficial to them. And to, and so you'd have a record of how many times a police officer would stop a black man on the street. Now, since the new government is coming um, um, since last year, they've overturned all of that and said the only time a record must be given is during a, a search of a vehicle. 
and not when somebody's been stopped on the street anymore. Because in that way, you could see which officer were being racist towards a black, op- um, a black person and how many times that person had been stopped. So all of that is, you know, I think, you know, new government's coming, a lot of that is going to be wiped away. Um, re- recruitment retention, you don't hear too much about that anymore. So uh, black officers are still leaving the force once they join because of the racism that they're experiencing. Wow. That's just sub- that's just some of the stuff around the um the seventy recommendation. Um, again, <laughs> context of white supremacy, and I hope uh, people that are listening to the program, uh, I hope you all are, are receiving the information the same way that I am, and this is sounding very familiar. Uh, unfortunately, very familiar to a lot of the racist practices. Uh, in this particular area of the world. Um, You uh, talk a lot about the work that you've done uh, since the murder of your child. Uh, And you, obviously, you have the Stephen Lawrence uh, Charity uh, Trust, uh, the Stephen Lawrence Center. Um, I wanted you to talk about that, but I I wanted to touch on just the the depths of the racism uh, that you have experienced. I mean, this is... uh, This is just disgraceful. Uh, On page 220, um, they uh, they made a you're talking about the uh, recognition uh, in remembrance of Stephen Lawrence and uh, a company decided to uh, replace. uh, This is the monument uh, for Mr. Lawrence. uh, And they paid for something the size of a small paving stone, though it blends in so well with the pavement that you would hardly know it was there. It has been attacked many times. People urinate on it. They spit on it. Grind takeaway food scraps into it. It kept happening so often that Greenwich Council decided to erect a camera to try to catch anyone causing damage. Uh, Just after the report of the public inquiry, a tin of white paint was spilled over the plaque. On the very day that Jack Straw decided to visit the spot, but there was no way of knowing who was responsible because there turned out to be no film in the camera. Uh, Also, I read uh, the Stephen Lawrence Center. Um, It opened, I believe, in 2008, Uh, right after it opened uh, a week or so after it was opened. It, too, was vandalized. Is that is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. We had um, eight windows um, broken, and these were double height windows. Um, so it seems as if they, they wanted to break all the windows in the front, the front of the building, and they managed to break eight. And these windows, I say, you have Chris O'Feely, who is a um, a Turner Prize winner. His artwork is um, is in the glass, so they broke that. And yes, at each time Stephen's name. Um, if, if there's any report about him, like around the anniversary of his death or when the case was going on, always something happened. In fact, just um, Christmas, what I tend to do is at his birthday, the anniversary of his death, and at Christmas time, I go and put some flowers down um, at the plaque where he died. And the flowers always, people always take, <laughs> they always take the flowers. You know, they steal the flowers. And um, this Christmas that's just gone, I went there with my granddaughter to put some flowers down. And the same day, I had a phone call telling me that somebody's walking past for the flowers and just helped themselves to it. So it still it, it still happens. You know, it still happens. Um, the day when um, Jack Straw, because Jack Straw at the time was the Home Secretary, I um, mean, the government... And after the inquiry, he wanted to go and visit where Stephen died. And um, when we arrived, um, I just, you know, you were saying that this, there was a, you know, they spilt white paint all over it. And you think, okay, the camera is there, so we'll know who it, who's, you know, who's responsible. And then to find that there was no film in the camera, you know, it, it's just unbelievable that, you know, the level of where between the police, 
Greenwich Council, all the work that they say that they're doing and protecting this plaque, that they have no intention of doing that. And after that incident, they're supposed to put, um, you know, film with us in the camera. And I was passing there one day, and we've had we had to, we've had to put a new plaque there because the other one was so damaged you couldn't make anything out of it anymore. We've had a new one put down, and I was passing there with a friend, and we decided just to stop and just pay respect, just have a look. And they've taken a hammer to it again. They start damaging it. So I went and got a camera, took a picture, contacted the police and said, you know, we've been there and this is what's happened. And yet again, there was no film in the camera. So they couldn't say who's been attacking the pack again. And now what's been happening since I've complained again, I'm not saying it still happens now, but I, I was there one day when a police officer... He's got a picture of the plaque. He gets out of his van. He looks at the picture. He looks at the plaque to see if there's any damage before they tape over um, the film. Now, to me, that's just a waste of, of um, police resources. Now, if they were doing their job, they wouldn't have to be doing that. But because they don't want me to keep complaining, that's what they do now. And I just think it's just, you know, that's a waste of police resources for for an officer has to physically go with a picture to check to see if the plaque's been damaged again. Mm. <sighs> Context of white supremacy, global system, global system. Um I wanted you to uh, just talk a little bit because it was um, it was just really inspiring the work that you're doing at the center. If you could talk a little bit about what you do and and the scholarships that you provide. Yeah, um, the, well, the center was opened back in 2008, and it's David Ajay who's the architect um, for that. Um, Steve wanted to be an architect. And so we started back in 98, that's when we first established the, the charity. And it's to give uh, mainly black and ethnic minority um, who, want, who want to train to be an architect. And so over the years, we've um, given students, and they are usually undergraduates, um, students, um, finance to support them, because architecture is a very expensive course. And also, not many black um, really think of it as, as a profession. So the trust helps to um, inform young people, do outreach, so that they can, you know, so they're better informed to say if, if that if that is the subject that they want to study and that's a profession that they want to go into. And so we give money to students over in Jamaica because Stephen's buried out in Jamaica. Um, South Africa because of support that um, Nelson Mandela gave us in the early stages and also to young people in this country. And over the years, we've sort of developed that a little bit further by not just looking at architecture as a profession, but looking at the whole built environment because within that you have engineers, you have surveyors. So we look at students who are looking to go into those professions also. We've also um, started looking at um, not just undergraduate, but looking at young people. And so you have primary and secondary young children who come to the center. And the idea also is to, I don't know, it's, it's, um, it's to give them support in whatever areas that they needed. We have, we have two computer suites. One is an Apple Max suite and one is a PC suite. Uh, within there, um, young people are, are um, writing their own computer programs and testing it out on each other. Um, we do employability and we work with um, um, local universities to give young people a little bit more opportunity so when they go out to look for work, you know, you sort of um, support them in a way in which how they um, approach an interview, how they do their CVs. So there's that work going on as well. We have our, our 
um, ladies, for, um, young people can come and do their own filming and record and edit. So that work happens there. We have a mentoring scheme, e-learning that we have. I'm trying to think what else. Um, we even do CSI, so there's a science-based program that the young people come in and do fingerprinting and looking at blood samples and stuff. And so is that the idea is to give them the opportunity to think of other professions that they would not usually think about. So the centre gives them, and we're based in, in the local area, and so we have the local community coming and using the space also. We just wanted to make sure that all young people have the opportunity to achieve whatever they want to achieve in life. To be, a, to be a center of excellence. Those are the sort of things that we're working on at the moment. Wow. Uh, the address, uh, if you want to get more information uh, on the center and what they're doing, uh, the web address again, www.stephenlawrence.org.uk. Again, that is www.stephenlawrence. Dot .org dot .uk um for the program wrapped up I wanted to uh, go to the phone lines to see if folks had any questions uh if you would like to uh ask a question uh the number is 347 215 6071 uh press 1 uh, if you have a question I can get your line um question I wanted to ask really quick we had um black people uh, in different areas in the UK on the program yesterday, and they were talking uh, just about their memories uh, of the Stephen Lawrence case, and uh, they were excited to have you on the program. And they were saying that they remembered uh, the Nation of Islam uh, providing security and just being there to support your efforts and white people in the UK being very upset about that. And I think one of them even said that he recalled them uh, white people throwing flour uh, on some of them. Um, is that is that accurate? Uh, was the NOI involved or supportive and were white people upset about that? Um, yes, they were. Um, this is um, during the inquiry and I know there's a major incident. We were upstairs in the inquiry room and there was a major incident. I think the police had throw or spray um, um, I don't know if that's mace spray in their eyes or something had to happen, and there was, you know, we had to go down and try and quiet the people down because they were very, very angry. Um, I think the police did not like the idea that they were there, and and all they were doing, they were, they, they were behaving in an orderly manner, so they wasn't causing any problem until that they had these substance sprayed in their faces when they got very angry. And there was nearly a riot breaked out down there. So we, you know, Neville and myself had to go and speak to them and just ask for calm um, at the time. You know, um, the Nation of Islam, they are peaceful. I mean, so I, I don't know of any incident that they have been um, in, any prop, in, in any trouble or any violence. They're quite peaceful. But on that occasion, the police, I think, deliberately tried to get them in a position where that they would react and react very badly. Wow. Very interesting. Unfortunately, it's uh, a very familiar story, unfortunately. Um, the person who called in from a blocked number, a uh, person who called in from a blocked number, did you have a question? Greetings, Gus Justice, and this is Lawrence. Can I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Um, is it okay for me to ask uh, two questions, Gus? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mrs. Lawrence. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Yes. It, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you, Mrs. Lawrence, and once again, my condolences go out to you and the family on this tragic loss of your child. I know how it's... I don't know as a parent because I've not buried any children, but... My my first husband, his um, he died tragically, and he was the firstborn child of my mother-in-law, my first mother-in-law. So I could understand what the feeling would be like to have to bury your child. 
What I was going to ask you, well, you're welcome, ma'am. What I was going to ask you, you were stating that the situation, the the racial atmosphere over there in the U.K. I've been there a few times, and I've noticed the attitude of the European in general on the continent. Has it, um, have you been compensated in any way for, have you been able to take like a civil suit towards the families of these victims? Because we know in the U.S., if you do not prevail in the criminal side, you can always go to the civil side and get compensated for your losses. Have you tried to go that route? Um, no, not against the family. We took out we we took out a civil action against the police of their handling of Stephen's case. Not against the family because we've got no evidence or anything to go against the family because there's nothing that we could use to take out a civil action against them. But we did take a civil action um, out against the police. Okay, and I know that the U.K. is very big on having cameras on just about everything in order to watch your activities, and you could be mapped mapped from the time you leave your home to the time you get back to it. Were there no cameras in any of the surrounding buildings since they say that the police did not have a video of this alleged incident? Were there any buildings or any service stations or anything that could have had a camera that could have caught the attack? Um, no, um, the area was a residential area, and in, I don't think you had that. You would have cameras in residential areas. Also, in '93, there—I mean, so like now in 2011, you have cameras practically everywhere. In '93, you wouldn't have had so many. You wouldn't. Um, you probably would have it on some public buildings, but not in a residential area, which is what, where, which is where um, the crime took place. Oh, okay. And um, are you, because I know most of the people that are transplanted to Great Britain, they have either African or West Caribbean back, background, because I have lots of my family members from the Caribbean that migrated to Europe. Have you thought maybe of um, perhaps moving back to the Caribbean? Because, of course, we've talked to a few people from the U.K. and they're seeing the situation over there is becoming so very hostile. They're looking at potentially leaving within the next few years because of the atmosphere and the feeling of being unwelcome? Um, I personally, um, my ex-husband um, lives out in Jamaica now. He doesn't live here anymore. Um, I was brought up in this country, and it is very difficult. I mean, if I was to go back to say, because my, my, my family's from Jamaica, and I was actually born in Jamaica, but I came here as a child. And for me to live in Jamaica is a completely different, I don't know Jamaica's way of life. And so, you know, no, I've not thought about living back in, over in Jamaica because to me, I think also it doesn't matter where you go in the world, yes, you have racism here, but the violence and stuff that happens over in Jamaica, you know, is just unbelievable. So, you know, which is the world all over, you have violence everywhere. And so, no, for me, I've not thought about living, moving back to Jamaica. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, caller down in Georgia. Hang tight. I want to see if I can get a couple of the other people that called in. A uh, person who dialed in, uh, mm, a uh, person who dialed in 4404, 4404, did you have a question? A uh, person who dialed in uh, last four digits four four oh four. Did you have a question? Okay. A uh, person who dialed in five four oh four five four oh four. Did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, uh, hello to everybody. I wanted to ask uh, Mrs. Lawrence has she um has she kept up? With the uh, suspected assailants and 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 uh, the death of her son and and uh, you know how the type of uh, people they've become or, or just interested uh, have, uh, have they kept up their uh, criminal activities and does she know? Um. Yes, as far as I know, they have. Um, there's one of them. Um, is being. Um, is in prison for um, smuggling drugs 
And over the years, um, I hear quite a few of them in, in and out of prison. So that is their way of life. You know, you know that's them. You know, so their way of life has not changed. Okay. Um, see, person who called in from a blocked number, different person called in from a blocked number. Did you have a question for Mrs. Lawrence? Yes, I do. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. I know that the, the the laws here sort of mimic the laws there. I was wondering if you're using an attorney to pursue your case against the police, knowing that the the courts are all connected with the cops and all, or are you doing it on your own accord? And if also, which venue are you doing it in? Do they? I don't know how to. It's it's a uh, set up over there. Are there higher courts that you took it to, or are you going to the local? Um, um, we have a solicitor. I mean, so you call them attorney over um, over in the States. We call them solicitors here. And we did. I mean, so when, when we took the case um, around Stephen, we went to the highest court in the land, the Old Bailey. Um at the time, we thought that we didn't have a single um, evidence that we could say, but we had a combination of things that we've collected over over the years. And we were led to believe at the time when we took the case to the private prosecution out against these boys that um, we stand a very good chance. And I think we would have stand a very good chance, except I believe they brought in a judge specifically um, around this case. And the judge did not allow um, the prosecution to present the case to the jurors. They spent about two weeks having legal arguments. And at the end of that, the judge instructed the jurors to bring in a not guilty verdict. Because we had three out, three out, of, out of the five boys that we had enough against them. And the judge instructed the jurors to bring a not guilty verdict without them even had any of the case put um, to them. And at the time, I felt that we had, you know, we stood a good chance. But on reflection, the, what we were doing was the first it has ever happened in 150 years. 150 years that a private prosecution has been brought. And at the time, I believe that the government of the day, for some young, some black family to come and, and show the CPS, which is part of a, the government um, thing, for us to come and bring a private prosecution and win, one, the police could not, you know, the country could not have coped with that. There's no way the country could have coped with us showing up the justice system on the police. No way. And so they brought in this judge who just, who instructed the jurors to bring in a not guilty verdict. And that was the end of it. We did not stand a chance. The system was against us. Um, I guess knowing... Uh Knowing what you know now, would you still pursue bringing uh, the private case, uh, knowing what you know now? I think the stuff that came out of the inquiry and all that information, if we had those information, I think we'd have had a much better chance to have, have um, got a, um, a guilty verdict. If we had all the stuff that we came that came out of the public inquiry, if we had all that information, the fact that to know that there was somebody who walked into the police station within 24 hours and gave information to the police, names, addresses, we didn't know any of those stuff during that time. We did not know those information at that time. All of those information was hidden from us. Wow. Um, before we uh, wrap up, I want to check to make sure, Justice, do you have any questions that you would like to ask 
uh, Mrs. Lawrence and any of the folks, uh, if you want to get a question in before the program ends, the number is 347-215-6071. Uh, press 1 if you have a question. Uh, Justice, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Um, <clears throat> I do not uh, have any more questions for uh, Mrs. Lawrence. Mrs. Lawrence, uh, thank you for being on uh, the Cows Radio the Cows Radio program, and I hope we can have you back on. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the person who dialed in three one nine three three one nine three. Did you have a question for Mrs. Lawrence? Yes, I had a quick question. Um, over where you are, is there any um, uh, business or law um, organization that's set up to fight white supremacy that's going on over there? Um, not really. I think as, as a black community, it is very difficult um, to bring any cases at all against any racists in this country. It's very difficult. One, they've um, you don't have any such thing as legal aid. And most most black people within this country are in very low paid jobs so they couldn't even afford to take a civil action and that is what is against um, the black community in this country is that they don't have the way for all in order to, in order to do that um, in our instance we had our legal team working for nothing that is how come we got as far as we did they did not take a penny it wasn't until they went to the, um, in 95, that, that they were allowed to go to public purse to, to um, get any um, financial assistance whatsoever. Our legal team works for nothing, and you do not find many solicitors in this country are able to, and I can afford um, to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, in the last couple of minutes, I'll, I'll see if anybody else has a question, but I definitely wanted to ask, um, for anyone out there, uh, I know I focus a lot of my time and energy on racism, uh, and it seems that you do too, uh, for anyone out there, cause I've heard this from folks who says, you know, racism is, is not that big a deal. Uh, we've got plenty of other problems. You shouldn't, you know, spend so much time focusing on racism. It's not that big a deal. Uh, what would your response be to someone who said that? That's because they they are not um, feeling what we as um, people in the black community are experiencing. Now, you know, racism is something, you know, it it has the effect that people can lose their lives through racism, which is what happened to my son. And if people think it's not such a bigger deal, please tell me how did why did my son have to die? Why did my son have to die? And why do so many other young people have to die through racism if it's not such a bigger deal? The person who called in uh four four oh four 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 oh four, did you have a question? Yes, sir, thank you thanks for taking my call. Um, thanks for being on the program, Ms. Lawrence. I really enjoyed uh, hearing hearing you today and learning more about um, about your son. Um, I, I was curious. You were talking about damage to property. Um, I think you mentioned windows and some other stuff. Did and um, was anybody ever caught for any of that uh, of that uh, behavior? No, no. Um, as usual, um, the police say there's not enough evidence, they, the CCTV, the picture's too grainy, they can't see anything. No. Um, last year, was it last year? Yeah. Last year we had um, an incident, another window was broken, and these were, this was done by um, some young children, you know, aged about 12 or so. And at the time, we have a caretaker who was working, working at the centre, and he actually saw these young um, young people coming and coming, and um, he ran downstairs and apprehended um, these young people until the police arrived. And the police took him away, 
And then I had a phone call to tell me that they decided not to take any further actions because they're very young and, and it's their first um, first incident. And also, um, they don't want to give them a criminal record just in case they may want to travel to America. Were these kids white? Yes. Were they, were they, wow. Wow. Uh, who had to cover the uh, expenses, uh, you know, to repair? Well, well, we do. You know, the trust has the trust. The trust has to. Um, and so, when I challenged this, I said, you know, it's not the first time that we've had um, attacks um, to the building, and all the time the expense falls back on the on the trust. No, no, we don't get paid for any of that. The trust has to pay out for it. Mm. But uh, the, yeah, but the police decided that they weren't going to take no further action because they were young and it's their first incident. And just in case they may want to go to America, it wouldn't be wise for them to have a criminal record. Global, global. Um, may I ask how how what are the ages of your grandchildren? Um, I have a granddaughter who is six. And I have two grandsons who were born two weeks apart from each other. So one of them is two months old, another one is one month old. Two? Two? That's very nice, very nice. I guess, you know, this is, uh, I was listening to your story today. You know, it, it's it's uh, very touching because, you know, this, these incidents happen to black people all the time. You know, and it, it's very painful. Would your opinion of white people uh, change at all if, you know, <laughs> Similar to what happened to uh, one of your grandchildren, God forbid. Um, I suppose my level of trust is not the same as it used to be, and I suppose I'm always always trying to look at people in a much better light, rather than you know looking to say, well, that person must be a racist. I and mean, heaven forbid anything happened to any of my grandchildren. Heaven forbid. But I don't want to be like them, if 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 if, if, um, if you understand, because I don't want for me to behave the way which they behave. I don't want to have hatred and things that they have, because I think if you walk around with hate, it just heats, you know, it eats you up and it doesn't do you any good. And so I try not to do that, you know, because I just think, you know, I don't want to be like them. I really don't want to be like them. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And last question, 8162. 8162, did you have a question for Mrs. Lawrence? Uh, 8162, last four digits, 8162, did you have a question? I'm just listening right now. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. All righty. All righty. I think, uh, yeah, we are are just uh, at the two-hour mark. Um, I want to uh, just thank you. Uh, I am so grateful uh, that you are willing to share some of your time with us. Um, It it just has been an incredible uh, honor uh, to hear from you. Um, Man, (laughs) I hope people read the book. Um, almost speechless. I hope people will read the book. Uh, it is it is just uh, super touching, uh, and you will learn a lot about racism. Uh, it's it's really an incredible read. Um, the title and still I rise seeking justice for Stephen. Um, I don't. It might be a little more difficult to get in the states. I'm not sure, but uh, you should definitely make an effort to find it. It is uh, it is a fantastic read, and uh, I'm just I'm thrilled that we were able to have you on the program. Um, if there's anything you would like to share with our audience before uh, we wrap things up, please feel free. Um, I just wanted to thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, to be on your show and to um, to, to, to speak to um, your audience. Um, it's, not, it's not an opportunity I've been given um, often. Um, I think that as I've, I've traveled to the States quite a few times. I have a brother who lives in Maryland, so I'm always um, traveling to the States. And I just think that there are times when, especially when um, Barack Obama came in, how much 
um, you've progressed. I know racism and the still exists, but the mere fact that you've got a black president is something I don't think. I don't know when we in this country will ever get to that stage. So my hat's off to all of you over there for um, to be able to take, the, you know, to move forward that you have a black president. And I was there on his, his uh, inauguration. I was one of the two million people standing out in the cold cheering him on on that day. It was a fantastic day. So thank you once again. The pleasure was all ours. Um, the website, again, for folks you can get more information, uh, uk, and that's Stephen, S-T-E-P-H-E-N, stephenlawrence.org.uk. Um, thank you so much for sharing some of your Saturday evening uh, we thoroughly enjoyed it and learned a ton. Uh, we uh, would really enjoy an opportunity to have you back anytime. Uh, and if there's anything we can do to help you all out with the uh, Stephen Lawrence Center, please let us know. I'm going to link uh, the website so more people will, will find uh, your website and uh, learn more about it. And uh, if there's anything we can do to help, let us know. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a Bye. fantastic evening. Okay, right. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Context. Okay, bye. Good evening. Context of white supremacy. Um, our guest joining us live from the United Kingdom, uh, Mrs. Doreen Lawrence. Um, special thank you to uh, Ross43. Um, I don't think that program would have happened if it had not been uh, for him. He is uh, an investor in the U.K. He was on the program yesterday you can go in the archives uh, for Friday, February the 11th. Uh, he was on the program. He and uh, a couple other uh, black males from the United Kingdom, they were on the program. And uh, I thought it was very constructive, very constructive. Um, just any time, I think, getting being able to hear non-white people in different parts of the world, I think it can really do a lot. I'm always looking for the fast Footbutting um, because I'm impatient. Uh, I'm trying to replace white supremacy like immediately, and I feel like non-white people, if we're able to have constructive dialogue about white supremacy with non-white people from as many different parts of the planet as possible, that will one help to make it real clear: oh, it is a global system, and they're doing a lot of the exact same things all over the planet. Got it. I'm hoping that's the effect it will have. I'm hoping to continue this. Um had a gentleman, black male, uh, email me today from Japan. Uh, he said he was listening to the show. I can call Japan, so I'm going to see if we can get him on the program. Uh, as I said, I've been in touch with people from Australia. Um, I hope, you know, this represents... Um, I hope this represents where we've come. We're coming up on two years, so I've had to look back at the archives to look at some sound clips to play for the two-year anniversary. And uh, I hope this program, if it's been constructive, this is indicative of the body of work that we've done in the first two years and potential for where we can go uh, with counter-racism, not just the program, but with counter-racism on the whole uh, and replacing white supremacy with justice, uh, where you have non-white people who are, you know, eight different time zones apart who are on the same page, global system of white supremacy, bam. I'm hoping we can get there real quick. And uh, please, I'm hoping to get more participation from non-white people worldwide. But again, uh, thank you to Ross43. I don't think this program would have happened had it not been for him. Uh, he mailed me the book. That was that was reading <laughs> this program. That would I think this will be my new exhibit A in terms of reading and how if you can read the right books under racism, white supremacy, you can learn a lot. You can do very constructive things if you do some reading. Um, he sent me the book. I knew about the case with Stephen Lawrence. Um, I didn't know a lot about it, but I knew a little. Bit. I knew it had a lot to do with white supremacy and that you know, these racists had killed him. But uh, he mailed me the book. Um, I was able to just go, you know, to her website for the center. I called them the investments, you know, culmination of where we've been, the investments. I got my cool Skype line now so I can make 
long distance phone calls around the world very easily. I called the center and uh, they were able to set things up pretty quickly. We were able to make the uh, program happen in a matter of weeks. I contacted them at the end of January and uh, there it is. So I, I think it was very constructive and I don't normally say that about programs, but it was just a real treat to have her uh on the program. Um, and I hope people in the States, I hope, man, I hope y'all will listen and, and make an effort to get her book, man. Uh, and still I rise seeking justice for Stephen Lawrence. I will read that passage again about the vandalism, but this is this book reading. This is one of those books that you read and you will be like, man, kill every white person. I know that's not the feeling that she expressed on the program. She was very clear about that. She doesn't feel that way and all that, but I mean, just, understanding how white people behaved in a case like this, this is one of those where you'll just be like, yeah, all white people, <laughs> I don't like any of them, you know, forget all of them. But uh, yeah, what I said the first time specifically, this is one of those books where you'll be like, man, I want to kill all the white people. This is one of those books. Um, one of those incidents. One of those incidents. Uh, I want to read the part about the vandalism again. I will get Justice's view and uh we might actually wrap today. I haven't really done much self-preservation in terms of not going the full three hours. I think I'm going to do that today because we have a program tomorrow. Uh, and I didn't, man, we have a white person coming tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow should be constructive too. But I want to read about the vandalism and then we'll get to that and I'll get Justice's views as well. Uh, this is on page 220. And again, thank you, Roz43. Man, what an investment. Uh, books, everything. It's been super helpful. I hope the program was worthy of the investment. Um, with regards to the vandalism, the first plaque laid down in Well Hall Road was commissioned by black workers in Greenwich who collected money for the purpose. It was a small tablet and it was vandalized so badly that you could not recognize Stephen's name. A company decided to replace it, and they paid for something the size of a small paving stone. Though it blends in so well with the pavement that you would hardly know it was there. It has been attacked many times. People urinate on it. They spit on it. Grind takeaway food scraps into it. It kept happening so often that Greenwich Council decided to erect a camera to try to catch anyone causing damage. Just after the report of the public inquiry, a tin of white paint was spilled over the plaque. On the very day that Jack Straw decided to visit the spot, but there was no way of knowing who was responsible because there turned out to be no film in the camera. Now it is the job of the police to monitor the camera and someone has to check through the film before it can be wiped or taped over again. Page 220. This is white people. This is white people. Worldwide. Worldwide. At any rate, um, Justice, did you have any thoughts uh, on today's program, which you heard from Mrs. Lawrence? Um, no, I, I, I don't, but, um, yeah, yeah, I don't. Groovy, groovy. Would you uh, like to give your blog and email address? Sure. Um, justice.asap at yahoo.com justice.asap at yahoo.com uh, blog address just do justice today dot blogspot dot com again just do justice today dot blogspot dot com groovy context of white supremacy uh, I am going to do self preservation today I'm not going to hang out for the full three hours um, but we will be back tomorrow. Um, I hope people are sharing. Please share the links for the program. That is super, super helpful, uh, especially for this link. I would I would like people to listen to this program. I think this is uh, a lot of constructive information. So tweet it, Facebook it, email it, however you can get it out. Post links uh, on your website if you have a blog or any other web page. 
Uh, you can put the HTML code up so you can put the player so people can listen to the program from your page. You can put this specific program on your page. Uh, people can listen to it and never have to leave your site if you think it's constructive. If you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, but tomorrow's program, uh, this was a suggestion from a listener, uh, Mr. Daryl Bain. He is a white man. He is the author of The Melanin Apocalypse. Uh, this book, uh, I'll just read the back cover again. A man-made virus is killing all the blacks in the world. The African continent is devolving into complete chaos. Blacks in America begin rioting and killing whites. Israel and the Arab states go to war again. The oil fields of the Middle East and Africa are up for grabs. The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta provides the only possible bulwark against the whole world falling into anarchy. Unfortunately, the CDC comes under attack by mobs of angry, sick, and dying blacks, while scientists inside search desperately for a cure. The Melanin Apocalypse, Daryl Bain, Context of White Supremacy, uh, Showtime will be uh, Sunday, February the 13th. 3.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Central, 12.30 p.m. Pacific, Daryl Bain, The Melanin Apocalypse should be very interesting. I've already started reading it. That's what I'll be doing for the next 24 hours is finishing this and preparing for what I hope will be a very constructive uh, entertaining broadcast tomorrow. This is fiction, so they tell me. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And this was a request from a listener. So hopefully uh, it'll be constructive. And the person who suggested this, they will be pleased. Uh, we are going to call it program. Uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning into the broadcast. I'm going to play Mr. Edward Williams commercial for counterracism.com on the way out. Uh, and first, we're going to take a moment of silence. Uh, in recognition uh, of Mr. Stephen Lawrence. Context of white supremacy. Replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. <laughs> 